If you are in sales or just a, a, a solopreneur, entrepreneur who works for yourself, on occasion, you will still be in a management position. Now, is anybody in here in a management position now? All right, we have a couple. All right. Has anybody uh, been in a management position in the past? Yes. Okay. Does anybody anticipate being in another management position in the yeah, future? I hope not. Okay. Well, at some point, you hope Never. We appreciate the uh, we appreciate the honesty. Well, and that pretty much hits all of us. But at some point, we'll more than likely be in a management position. So. What I want to be talking about today is the eight most common mistakes of management, especially new managers. So for some of you, because Linda, she's, she sat through this again, but she said she didn't mind. Uh, I'm actually writing a book about this, and I have the first chapter, which I'm going to release as an ebook in just a couple of weeks. And uh, so I'll kind of go deeper into chapter one. All right. As we go through there, eight common mistakes of new managers. Number one is leading everyone the same way. <laughs> leading everyone the same way. Mm -hmm. Now we've heard this business maxim. It's almost a cliche. I want to be fair. So I treat everyone equally. I treat everyone the same. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. Unless your team is made up of nothing but clones, that's a big mistake. Everybody has different emotional drivers. Everybody has different perceptions of how they see the world. Well, for one thing, you have those people who are the creative types versus the analytical types. I am an analytical. Anybody else in here, you're kind of left brain, analytical, you're very math based. Okay. But I'm, I'm trying to get out of that, so I'm pushing myself towards some of the creative stuff. And we have a couple of realtors. Who's a realtor? Raise your hand if you're, yep, there you go. So, as a realtor, you're forced to access both sides of your brain. Because you have to do the competitive uh, market analysis, but then you actually have to market that listing, and that's the creative side. So you have to access a little bit of both. Well, many times people will sort of fall, they'll skew one way or the other. And so you may have one person who's very creative and another person on your team who's very analytical, good with numbers. And that's kind of how my daughters are. I have one who is very analytical and the other one is a little bit more creative. She, she enjoys art. If I parent them both the same way, it's going to be, uh, number one, a nightmare for me. <laughs> <laughs> number two, a nightmare for either of them. So I have to meet them where they are in terms of them as an individual. You also have so many different people in generations. You know, we still have the, what we call the greatest generation who is still at work, some of them. They're in their 70s, 80s, 90s even. And uh, some of them still, still work. You have the baby boomers. You have the best, what I consider the best generation ever. That's Gen Xers. That's just me. <laughs> And then you have, of course, millennials. Any millennials in here today? Any millennials? No, no millennials. Okay. Well, we're oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Well, we're still all trying to figure out millennials. We're still all trying to figure out millennials. Here's a secret: when it comes to their communication style, when they were teenagers and in their early twenties, that's what they prefer. That's what they prefer. And so that's a huge key for them. So if you want to get a Gen Xer's attention, sending them an email or writing them a note, they're never going to open the note, probably, unless it's specifically pressed to them in a very nice envelope. But texting them will get them immediately. And so if we're going to deal with all these different generational types, we need to learn how to communicate with them and teach them how we prefer to communicate as well. So that's a big problem right there, is just leading everyone the same. Number two, offensive or abusive behavior. Offensive or abusive behavior. What worked on a construction site 20, 30 years ago does not work in the office today, let me tell you. You've got to rein it in. 
And sometimes we have to show up at work and we've got to be a little bit less of ourselves <laughs> than we are in our private lives. And when you start using coarse language and you start talking bad about other people behind their back and you're obnoxious, you're telling rude jokes, you're just going to turn people off and you're going to lose respect as a manager. So you've got to bring that in. Failing to show appreciation. Failing to show appreciation. And I've actually had managers say, Blaine, you know what? My workers, they receive my appreciation at 5 o'clock Friday when they get that check. That's how much I appreciate it. Major failure. Major failure. You're about to have a coup on your hand is, is what you're going to have. We don't operate like that. Unless you're just really, really left brain like me, we typically don't operate like that. People need a certain amount of encouragement. And we look to our leaders to give us that encouragement. And I'll be honest, I have been in a situation where I've been a leader of something, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to, I need to tell these people how much I appreciate them. I just kind of, I have to remind myself, because I assume they know how good a job they're doing. No. We still kind of need that verbal reinforcement. And if it comes from leadership, that is so key. Poor communication skills. Poor communication skills. Not able to articulate your thoughts in a way that that individual will understand what it is that you want. The lack of active listening skills that can absolutely crush you as a manager. I consider communication to be the foundation of good leadership. That's where it starts. That's where it begins. You must have good communication skills. Not leading by example, okay? Anybody ever tried this with your kids? Do as I do, not as I, or do as I say, not as I do. How did that go? It didn't work, it did it? No. I had one experimental child, and then I had two others. That's so true. I, that's what I used mean. to tell. You're the oldest of the experimental child. Oh, okay. I like that. I like that. It was said that B. F. Skinner, B. F. Skinner, who was a psychologist, he theorized what it would be like if he took his kid and put his kid in a crate until he was about twelve. This <laughs> dark. But he theorized, you know, what would it be like if someone grew up in an experiment most of their lives and uh, they were cut off from the rest of the world. And, uh, and I think his, his actual son really did go on to become a psychologist. It was uh, called the Skinnerian Box concept. It never really happened. So, leading by example, you can be too friendly. Oh, man. What if you get a promotion for your team and you're... You're, you're friends with all your teammates. How do you navigate that? How do you handle that? That's tough. That's rough. It doesn't last for long. It probably doesn't. At some point, you're probably going to have to rip the Band-Aid off, lower the boom, have a coming to Jesus meeting, whatever you want to call it, and there's going to be an upset. They're testing their boundaries. It's just human. It's just human. And you're going to have to have that talk. And then, uh, but... As long as they know that you still respect them, that's going to carry through. That's going to carry through. But that is a big challenge. That's a big challenge. And you can't be a good manager while still being buddy with everybody on the team. Not being present enough with your team. Not being here in the moment. Not being mentally, emotionally, and physically. Something Peter Drucker called management by walking around. A lot of times managers like to hold up in an office and they don't come out and make physical contact, even just shaking hands or looking someone in the eyes with their people. You have to do that. You're not leading a room full of robots or computers or AI software. You're leading people and therefore, you have to make contact with them somehow. It's so important. And last, managing. Blank managing. What do you think I'm going to say here? Micro. Oh, micromanaging. 
here's the here's the deal. Here's the challenge. Next time you have a project, tell that individual or your team what it is that you want them to do. Let them figure it out. Oh, but Blaine, I'm just helping them to do it the way that I did it a few years ago. Yeah, that's micromanaging. That's micromanaging. Give them what, and, and you can tell them what the standard is. Here's what I need at the end of this. Let them figure out why. But Blaine, what if they, what if they make mistakes? Here's the news. They will. <laughs> and you're not going to learn until you make those mistakes. But out of those mistakes comes excellence. So allow them the opportunity to be excellent. Now, these are the top eight that I have identified through my coaching, my corporate training, and my public speaking, and people who have come and interacted with me after some of my sessions. It's not a complete list, but these are the top eight. And hopefully here in just a couple, a couple three months, uh, Lori is a motivator of mine, so I've been, I've been reading some of her books lately, and uh, got to write that book, got to do it. So I'm thinking I'm going to call it Blind Sides, Managerial Mistakes, Missteps, and Misunderstandings, and How to Overcome Them. That's a long title, though. <laughs> All right, so my name is Blaine Little. My company is Momentum Seminars Training and Coaching. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. And let me know how I can help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.